Now, to read a novel by Umberto Eco is to enter an enchanted forest, a symbol-drenched, passion-drowned forest that's alive with murmurings, heavy with history and glittering with myth. Now, he writes of mad monks and museums of technology and, in his latest book, of night-shrouded cemeteries that are filled with quivering, iniquitous souls. And he writes about things we all recognize, lust and greed and love, curiosity, envy. His books may dazzle us with their erudition, but they also are entertainments. They're beguiling. Now, if you're here today, you already know all of this that I've just said, but I hope that after today's session, you're going to know him quite a bit better. So it's my great honor and privilege to ask you to join me in welcoming to Chicago, Professor Umberto Eco. Professor, your new novel is, um, I think, one that contains things that we all recognize. It's seemingly set in the 19th century, but the Prague Cemetery, of course, has things that sound eerily contemporaneous. They are um, all kinds of conspiracies and cabals and, and plots that are hatching all over the place. So my question for you is, how in the world did you know this would be happening now? If I wrote this novel, it was exactly because I believe that it can happen and will happen now and in the future. And uh, when writing, even though I made a lot of research to, to, to dive practically into the 19th century and to live in that era, I was continuously aware that I was telling about something around me. And I was always thinking of somebody I knew. And I would like that my reader use this novel as a guide, as a Bedecker, to go around to say, oh, look one Simonini, look one Simonini, look one Simonini. <laughs> you can do it in Italy, but you, I think that you can do it also in Chicago or in, or in Washington, or in Washington, or in uh, Paris. Or <laughs> because the, the, the history, well, I have written largely on the function that uh, forgeries have had in the, in the, human, in the human history from, from, from the beginning. Sometimes even they had a positive function, for instance, inventing the marvelous kingdoms and people went to explore the world in order to find them the Eldorado myth, and so on and so forth, and sometimes having terrible effects is the case of the, of the protocols of the elders of science. So I think that the, 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 the everyday activity of many politicians, you know, journalists, newspapers, is to produce a fake dossier. <laughs> is to give fake news. You know, being interested in the problem of languages, I am a semiotician, so I am interested in various forms of communication. I was interested in lying because it's a typical human activity. <laughs> no, a, a dog tells always the truth. When a dog barks, means that there is somebody outside. I have never seen a dog who barks in order to cheat me and to say that there was somebody outside. And what. No. So a, a dog is unable to, to lie. We lie continuously, even in everyday life. Oh, nice to see you. No, it's, it's a very polite, uh, it's a very polite lie, okay. It, uh, uh, you look very well today. <laughs> we are lying for more reasons and we are lying for, for, for terrible, so the, the human, Life is, uh, is completely filled up with, uh, with, uh, with lies and fake news and so on and so forth. That, that's my, the story of my Simonini who was obviously an exceptional liar, but really a maybe, professional liar. Right, maybe just a, uh, those of you, the, the Prague Cemetery is about, 
if you want to just give maybe a brief um, synopsis about this character in the 19th century who really, uh, in effect, winds the clocks of all the great conspiracies from the 19th century, including that, that, that great forgery, the protocols of the elders of Zion and other, other uh, forgeries and all, all the bad things that happened in the world in the 19th century could, could be at this character's feet. And, and a great part of the novel is his diary and his musings on what he's doing and why including the great, the great Latin phrase, uh, Odi ergo sum, I hate, therefore I am. <laughs> and that's one of the phrases that struck me, thinking, boy, that sounds so much like what we hear today. We hear a lot of the motivations for the, uh, some of the terrible events that are now rocking the world, uh, from economic crises to, to great political turmoil and terrorism and all the other terrible activities that we, we think are so new and so unprecedented, of course, have their origin many, many centuries ago. Um, and your other novels, too, of course, deal with conspiracies and the tendency of human beings to not live up to our potential as moral beings. Yes, uh, well, uh, at least one, uh, the Foucault's Pendulum, but it was, uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, different because it was on the paranoia of the universal conspiracy, so it was a grotesque representation of people who believe or pretend to believe in a, in a uh, general conspiracy. And in this case, Simonini makes re real conspiracies. But we, 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 have, to, we have to make a, a, a very sharp distinction between a conspiracy and the paranoia of the word conspiracy. Conspiracies exist. Uh, in order to kill Julius Caesar, they made a conspiracy. It was discovered the day after, on the same day. Uh, Catilina was making a conspiracy, Cicero denounced it uh, in the Senate, and the conspiracy was uh, probably in this moment in Rome, as in Washington, people are making conspiracy, I don't know, to, 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 to conquer a bank, to, to, to change a uh, minister. But the paranoia of general conspiracy, world conspiracy, is there is somebody, and we don't know right. which one, who in the world is trying to organize every, everything. It's a sort of occult power who has all the responsibility. We are not responsible. That's why all the dictators used the uh, idea of a general uh, conspiracy in order to, to not to be criticized, uh, to keep their people united against somebody, right. somebody else. I, as a young boy, uh, having been born in 32, so uh, the first 10 years of my life were under the fascist uh, education. I was educated to hate the conspiracy of the demo pluto judo democracies. Uh, democracy, plutocracy, uh, the rich person, and the Jews, that was the, uh, the world conspiracy. And uh, well, uh, we are celebrating, we were celebrating yesterday in Italy, the resignation of yes. uh, Berlusconi, <laughs> uh, a portentous uh, event uh, by which I, I read in the newspaper that people in the street was singing Handel's Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, uh, Berlusconi lived uh, always speaking of a, of a conspiracy of the judges and all the communists. Mm -hmm. There are no more communists in, in, the, in this world. You, <laughs> you cannot find them. But he was continuing to say, they are there, they are there, they are menacing not only me, but you, Italian. So, the, you have to invent the conspiracy. The Jewish uh, conspiracy was on the great element of the, this uh, paranoia, not, not only in the, in, the, in the 19th century, but one of the documents uh, were the, the protocols, and they were certainly born in the second half of the 19th century. And they were, I say, certainly, because the only technical proof we are is that they were published in Russia in 1905, but all the uh, concoction uh, lasted for some decades, uh, let's say from 1860, 1850, to until the end of the century. This 
uncertainty about uh, the concoction allowed me to invent uh, a fictional story about uh, I could attribute to Simonini many deeds that were certainly accomplished by somebody else, but we don't we do never know exactly who they right. they were. Uh, yes. Because there were many, many hands at work. Mm -hmm. It's funny, when you mentioned there are no more communists in the world, I just recalled a joke I heard recently that the only communists left are on American college campuses. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe true. I, I want to ask you, we have such a short time here today, but, and I wanted to mention, too, we're going to be taking questions from the audience in just a couple of minutes um, after we've finished talking here. And if you would, if you do have a question, uh, Professor Echo would ask if you come down front, so make sure he'll be able to hear you. So if you have a question percolating in the back of your mind, um, just come forward in, in just a moment when we go to a question session. Um, I, I wanted to mention, you, you love lists, lists, long catalogs, long litanies of things in your books. They're filled with this, these beautiful long lists. And you have a wonderful section. I have written also a book on lists. Yes, yes, exactly, yes. I was going to say. And, and you, you talk about the, reason, the reasons why. And when you pointed that out, it, 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 I began to think of all the books that do have lists in them that, we don't, that I hadn't really thought of. Uh, Moby Dick is filled with long lists, and uh, Colin Harrison's uh, Manhattan Nocturne, long lists, and Tim O'Brien's story, The Things They Carried. They have such power. And I, I was curious, about when, when did you realize that? When did the list sort of make itself known to you as more than a technique, but a kind of a poetical force? A long time, a long time ago. Uh, now I can tell you, okay, the first uh, paramount example of list uh, is in uh, uh, Homer's Iliad, mm -hmm. huh? where it is the so-called uh, catalog of ships. Uh, and what was the, the, the purpose of, of this list? They were too many. It's impossible to name all of them. So my mouth has no enough tongues to tell of this is a poetical topos that returns uh, returns uh, many times uh, in the history of literature they have not enough tongues to to say and so the list uh, being always incomplete even though very long must give you the sense of infinity in this sense it is a beautiful uh, resort a beautiful uh, uh, Literary, literary strategy, just in order to suggest uh, infinity. Uh, uh, it is very difficult to, to suggest infinity without a list. I think that the only one who, who succeeded was Dante Alighieri at the end of the paradise when he watched watch in God and in three tercets he says everything eh? without making a list. But uh, it's, a very, it's a very exceptional case. I think that I found first the lists and I became fond of them because I started uh, as a medievalist and uh, by reading medieval poetry, and it was full, it was uh, very... Uh, and I remember that when I made in, um, in, uh, at Harvard uh, the Norton Lectures, my first idea was to make them on lists. I, uh, then I, uh, I abandoned the idea for many reasons. And uh, two years ago, I was, uh, the Louvre is and was organizing every year in November. They gave the museum to somebody and tell uh, him or her, do what you want. And that year it was mine. And I chose the list. And the museum made concerts, debates, exhibitions, everything on the concept of list. And what had to be the catalog became then uh, a, huge, uh, a huge book. But uh, so I made uh, not a list of lists. Right. <laughs> it's, it's just very powerful, you know, in ways uh, that in reading your work, when you stop. And I always try to read them aloud, you know, thus frightening other people in my home. This has also, uh, <laughs> this has also a, a, a mystical effect. Mystical, Think yes, uh, uh, yes. in every religion there are litanies, the litanies of the Blessed Virgin, mm -hmm. uh, the Rosary, or the Om Mani Padme Om in Buddha, the repetition of long series of elements that 
can create uh, sometime the ecstasy. Yes. So the yes. list can create uh, the ecstasy. The, the poetical list was, was only aims only to suggest the possibility of an ecstasy. The religious, yes. the liturgical list, uh, on the contrary, would like to produce the ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Well, I've read that you own 50,000 books. Is it uh, thereabouts? Yes, but uh, in my apartment in Milan, only 30,000 because there is no, 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 no more place. I, I had to move several times and then I stopped. Only 30,000. 30,000 they are, 30,000 must be. So every six months I decide which one will be moved to the countryside or to my office at the university or give it. But probably altogether, can make 50,000. And the reason I ask is because I've also read that you believe that the e-book and the e the question I'm asked most often, anywhere I go, if anyone hears that I write about books, the first question is always, are we even going to have books 10 years from now, five years from now? And you have written that you think that the e-book and the, the, any kind of electronic edition is not necessarily going to displace the traditional book. No, is that I right? So, so uh, listen, I am... Uh, in this moment, changing some of my ideas about uh, this problem, because I was convinced that it's impossible to, to read peacefully a novel on, uh, on an e-book. Mm -hmm. But since in my last uh, trip uh, in, in October, 20 days, I brought with me 10 or 12 books uh, to read, and so I destroyed my, <laughs> uh, my army. This time, I charged on my iPad, I, I, iPad uh, mm -hmm. 20 or 25 novels. And it is uh, a week that I read on the iPad during uh, when I am at bed. It's a little embarrassing because if you move a finger too, too fast, <laughs> all, all, all the pages shift away, and, and with a book, on the contrary, we can do what you want. But okay, but the, the, real, the real problem is a double one. One is the physical, erotical attraction of a, of a paper book. If I find in my cellar a book of my childhood, he does with the brown of the pages, with traces of my reading uh, scribbles, I don't know, it has something uh, that uh, appeals to, to my, make an appeal to my memory, is a, if I find in my cell a USB, uh, I have no, no physical emotions. Then there is another problem. I am a book collector, and I have some incunables who have 550 years. You open them, they look as they were printed yesterday with the white paper that met. We don't have any proof that a disquette can do more than 10 years. We don't have any proofs because in 10 years they changed the kind of computers. The computers who read the floppy disk now then were able only to, to read the diskette. Then they don't read any longer diskette but only USB. And, and so you, you don't have any proofs that can survive. They, they, can, they can survive a blackout, they can survive many, many other. Uh, many. I, I read uh, today on the airplane, there are those uh, uh, journals full of publicity, you know, typical couches for, for, for dogs, electrical couches for, for dogs, uh, and so electronic nose, uh, <laughs> marvelous. And uh, there was ah, a fantastic idea. If you have an analogic photograph, pull it in this new, uh, and transform it in a digital JPEG, so you save it for your, your sons and grandchildren. It is a contrary. The uh, analogic photographs on paper has more chances to survive than a JPEG, uh, a digital J JPEG. Okay. So that's a reason. Then 
I would be very glad if all the books disappeared and all these people would read only in the computer. So my collection of 50,000 books would become as important as the Tutankhamen treasure. <laughs> <laughs> That is certainly true, but you know, it occurred to me when I was reading an article um, that was a, about some of your comments on ebooks. I thought, you know, if it, we only had ebooks, there could be no name of the rose. The manuscript could not have. Let's see. Could you have? Could the poison have been put upon the uh, side of a Kindle? I mean, could you? Could you? The, the books have such a literary resonance. Just as you say, they have erotic resonance. They have this tactile resonance, and they have a great literary resonance. I mean, a book is more than just the story, just as you've suggested. Um, and I know that must be true yes, for you. It is, it is a diary of my reading, too. I make you an example. Uh, I am profoundly uh, linked to in a history of Middle Age of philosophy that I bought in the early 50s and accompanied me making my doctoral dissertations. But uh, every Every five or ten years, I went back, and so there, there are footnotes in black, and then order in red, and then order in green. But as every book published in the early 50s, you cannot touch it. It, it will, will be dissolved. It would be easy to, 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 to buy another copy for $10, but it, that one that counts for me, with just with all those not that is the story uh, of my of my career so to speak is the the story of my intellectual growth is that copy of that book a new one wouldn't say nothing to me that that's a book it it, it was a usb it wouldn't have the same impact it wouldn't, it wouldn't it is true that now with an iPad you can all also underline the pages of a book, but the way of underlining is the same for me and for you. So I don't know if that underlining was yours or mine. It makes an enormous, an enormous difference. Yes, there's something about that electronic highlighting that, yes. just as you say, because even highlighting is very specific and individual and, and eccentric, you know, the way, the way I do it versus someone else. Because the book was written by somebody else, but after you have read it and you are touched, it becomes also a, 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 a work of your own. That is an important element uh, of the book. I, I remember as a collector, I found once a um, 16th century edition, a copy of a Paracelsus that didn't have a particular uh, value because it was only one volume of a series of 15 volumes. So it's incomplete. But it was completely interwoven with a, a commentary in German and in Latin of an unknown author in three different colors with underlining that. So it is a sort of, uh, uh, like a Merletto, a Merlet, um, well, uh, as a sort of work of art in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in making a fabric. Eh? Mm. That is marvelous. That like it, tells me, yeah. it tells me a, a, a long story of, of somebody who was there and left uh, its uh, its, eyes, mm -hmm. its traces. Uh, its, uh, Okay, that's... <laughs> you know, as you've said, you, 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 of course, know the Middle Ages quite well. The medieval world was the subject of your, uh, your early academic work, and you've, you've written about now the 19th century and, and the 20th century as well. Have we... Does human nature change? Have we changed, or, or is there... Are we progressing at all in a moral sense? I mean, you, you are uniquely qualified to, to comment on that because you do. You know the medieval world so well, and you know the contemporary world. No, I think that the only improving, improvement of our species has been the length of human life, the span of human life. Okay. That's it. That That's is it. the only improved improvement uh, of the species. 
uh, it's not all the certain era were more moral or less moral, the, 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 you know, the, the moral values change, uh, and uh, th there were centuries in which uh, there were more massacres than, than today. Or, no. oh, the only, the only, in the Middle Ages, there was a legend saying that the, those who went in pilgrimage to a certain church could receive the grace of survival until 40 years. That means that 40 years was already a good, uh, a good achievement oh, for, great, for, great. For, for, for a person. Besides, uh, a cat is happy to live 12, 14, 14 years, so there is no problem. So we have... Uh, I am not so stupid to say, oh, this is not an improvement. No, it's a good improvement, uh, an interesting improvement. But some of the basic things, I mean, that's one of the reasons why reading something like The Name of the Rose, I think, is so, still such a, a moving experience for us because you see uh, the, the life being different in all, the, in all the particular ways, all the ways like the way food was gathered or the way people would sleep or the way they would, you know, the world lit only by fire, as the phrase goes. And yet, the same emotions, moved by the same emotions, uh, it, it, centuries distant. Fundamental emotions, yes, are, are the same. But you know, uh, also the, the way of producing babies is always the same. Well, yeah. <laughs> we have not changed uh, so, so much. No, but those explorations uh, on, on the past, uh, even the, the experience of, of reading, have another uh, function. They allow us to live uh, longer. I mean, an illiterate person, it could be uh, savage in the jungle, but it could be also uh, an important uh, political person who has not read any book in, in, in his or her life. A political, uh, 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 literate person, uh, when dying, has lived 70, 60, 80 years, and has the experience of his life. I, I have lived uh, 10,000 years. Mm. I was there when Julius Caesar was assassinated. I was there at the Waterloo battle. I was there with, uh, with Macbeth. Uh, I, I have, I have, you have, many of us have a lot of it. We have absorbed, so to speak, injected as they were a drug, the life for a lot of other people. So at the end of our life, we, we have lived uh, an immensity of years. That's why it's interesting to explore the, the past and to know how even by sharing the same fundamental passions than people of today, past people had different ways to, 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 to elaborate them, to, to, to suffer them, to... to that's, uh, it's very, that's why education saves people. Saves people, that's a wonderful, wonderful way to put it. And I was thinking that, that notion too of literature is as, as enhancing personal longevity, you know, really in a being the ultimate self-help. Yes, we have all these things that the we do. And longevity is as important as the physical one. Yes, yes. Well, we'll be, we'll be um, going to your all's questions. If you, if you would like to ask a question, if you would just uh, move here forward. And while we're waiting, um, your books are also, they're, 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 there's humor. There's humor in your work. You, you must see the value in it, obviously. I mean, as you're, it's not all just grim and... and well, probably there's humor even when I want to describe a tragic situation because, well, that's me. Uh, yeah. is my, is my way to, to see the world. Uh, if, you, if you don't react to life with humor, you're, you're lost. Hmm. <laughs> uh, never take things too much seriously, especially your own things. What's the great Don't take yourself seriously. Yes, yes. That's the great Horace Walpole line. Uh, the great uh, criminals comedy. and the great enemies uh, of the mankind were people who took themselves too seriously. Ah. 
You hear that said of politicians often, that the ones that take themselves too seriously are, yeah. That Hitler that. was obviously a person who took himself very seriously, <laughs> without any shade of humor. That's a very so. good point. Yeah, yeah, I haven't thought of it quite that way. And you do, I mean, you, there, is, um, there is ultimately a kind of a comedy at the bottom of all of it, is there, is there not? I mean, really, with our, our human, human aspiration and human... Um, it, it, even in the midst, as you say, of great tragedy and great catastrophe, because it's, it's, it is, I mean, we're all going to die, it's all going to be short in the end, and yet we have these aspirations, these immense, profound aspirations. Yes, but, uh, no, uh, maybe I, I missed the, the point. But humor is also a sort of a medicine uh, against uh, hatred. Ah. That in my novel, but my novel, Maybe we have not told that uh, by Simonini is evidently a racist, mm -hmm. okay? He hates everybody, not only Jews, Germans, French, uh, women particularly, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And hatred is a, is a strange feeling. Uh, at the end of, of the novel, uh, Rachkovsky, the chief of the of the Tsarist police, makes a sort of a apology of uh, of uh, hatred, and love is extremely selective. If I love you, I want you love me. I don't want that you love somebody else. I don't want that somebody else loves you, and so and so forth. So it restricts. The, the human relation. Hatred is generous. <laughs> it's warm. It keeps together an entire people against another people. No, that's why yes. it is used by politicians so frequently. They don't, they don't call for love. They call for hatred. You must die for uh, fighting against the enemy. Huh? Uh, Excellent point. The, the yes, yes. Government never says you have to love each other. Churches say so, not right. governments. It's a great tool. Uh, and to love, so it means to leak the leprosy. It's terrible to love. Uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta is repugnant. To hatred, on the contrary, is so, uh, so comfortable. And the only way to escape uh, the temptation of hating is humor. Even in this small, when I said, we are lying, even when you say, nice to see you. I hate people when the plumbers come to my house, works two hours, ask for a certain sum, sum and he goes and the, and the faucet still drops. <laughs> I get furious. And then, in Mubo, if he were intelligent, he would be professor of semiotics at the University <laughs> of Bologna. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And so humor saves you from hating this poor, this poor man. That's, uh, that's, uh. Well, put, we, actually, we have a question? Yes, yes it's, it's on a related topic, I think. It's a rather personal question. I'm wondering if you believe in God, and if so, do you, uh, how do you explain evil such as Simonini or Hitler or general evil? Is it perhaps God's sense of humor to make sure that our lives aren't totally boring? For the second question about evil, you should read St. Augustine, who devoted a part of his life to solve the problem of uh, evil. Apropos of God, I don't speak of private questions in public. Anyway, the only thing I am pretty sure, God believes in me. <laughs> I, I really do like that notion of humor being, in effect, a, a kind of a bulwark against hatred, being, being, a, uh, being almost a, a technique to keep one from, I guess, maybe being overwhelmed by the negative. And uh, it's, really, uh, it's really quite a profound notion. It can be also a protection, like in this case. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, we, sensed, we sensed a bit of that at, at work. Yes, yes. Why, why do we read? Why do, we, why do we read, yes, the average person? Why do you think they, they pick up books and read them? I mean, I, you have this great raging curiosity. 
but why? But, uh, you know, uh, the newspapers uh, every season say that uh, young people read less than before, nobody. So I don't understand, because there are, in Europe, as in the States, more and more enormous buildings of uh, three, four, five, seven floors selling books and full of young people browsing, browsing them. So what happens? One answer is all these young people uh, populating the, the books, the, the skyscrapers like bookstore has only a zero, 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 zero percent in comparison to the seven billion people that live now in our planet, which is absolutely true. But probably when I was a young man, I couldn't enter a bookstore because the bookstore was somber and the man dressed in black immediately came there and said, what do you want? Uh, I was obviously terrorized and I, uh, and I said, oh no, no, nothing. So probably the percent of young people reading at the time was the same than, than today and at that time we were two billions instead of, of seven. So it is obvious that uh, the, the reading population is always uh, a minority, but it depends. It's a minority in Italy, not in Japan. If you, if you go to, the, the, to the, the subway in Japan, everybody reading. is reading. Everybody is reading. In, in, in the States, they read more than, than in Italy, for instance. More, more newspapers, more, magazines, more, more books. They abandon them after they have read them. <laughs> that is another, is another problem. So I am not so pessimistic uh, about, uh, uh, about reading. Also because we read in many circumstances. You know, 30 years, 40 years ago, Marshall McLuhan uh, said, oh, the Gutenberg galaxy has finished, and now only the visual communication. Uh, and then, then, then he died. He, he, if he were there, he should recognize that with the computer, the Gutenberg galaxy had a fantastic rebirth, because in the computer, you, mm -hmm. you read. If you are unable to read, you, you are lost. Mm -hmm. Computer is not TV. It, a, so all these people who are reading the computer, they are readers, readers yeah. even though they don't, don't, don't read books. So I would be very prudent in being so uh, pessimistic and apocalyptic. Uh, I would rather ask, what do they read? That's another problem. Ah. <laughs> so. Uh, and what do they do in the, in the computer? They can, they can look in the philosophical site or in, in porno sites. We have another question. Yes. Well, you're a very, very witty, funny man. You've made us laugh. What makes you laugh? I, I lost it. Oh, she asked, uh, she said, you have made the audience laugh. So her question was, what makes you laugh? What, what sorts of humor appeal to you? You, you know that uh, humor doesn't mean to laugh, necessarily, uh, all the... I am unable to give you an answer because uh, since all the philosophers who try to describe laughing, uh, they, they made a failure. So that I hope for all my life to promise continuously to, to write a book about uh, laughing, not to do it so uh, after my death, a lot of people would make doctoral dissertations about my lost theory <laughs> of, of laughing. Because we, uh, laughing is a physical event. We laugh uh, sometimes for despise, des despair. The Japanese war prisoners laughed for embarrassment, and the Americans were astonished why they laughed. They laughed because they were embarrassed to be, to be car, uh, captured. Eh? Uh, there is a lot uh, of uh, people, especially in America, who used to, to laugh during the striptease. 
another kind of laughing for embarrassment, especially if there was the wife aside. <laughs> you know, to, 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 to. Uh, uh, Italians didn't they, they laugh during the distribution like this. So we laugh for many reasons. Sometimes because we are happy, but not necessarily we laugh for a comic uh, situation. And in the case of humor, you don't laugh. You smile, which is a different uh, attitude. So you laugh uh, if a general stepping down from the Pantheon stumbles. That is a laughing uh, situation. We don't laugh if the, if the accident uh, happens to an old lady. Uh, on the contrary, you have a movement of uh, uh, pity. And you smile if the old lady disguises herself as a girl. This is the essay of Pirandello on humor, a beautiful, a beautiful essay. Huh? If the, no, I repeat, if the general stumbles, you laugh. If the old lady stumbles, you don't laugh. Is the old lady believes to be still a girl and this guy herself, uh, eh? you smile. Uh, that's a humor, uh, humorous ob observation. And this uh, humorous observation is mixed uh, with understanding, mm. distance, piety, and a little sarcasm. Uh, is a mixed, uh, is a mixed. Uh, situation. Right. So I have been able to answer you, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Professor Recco, I'm curious as to how your experiences as a young child growing up in fascist Italy uh, inspired your literary career. My, uh, as a young child? Yes, growing up in fascist Italy, he asked, how, uh, that, how that influenced you. Obviously. Obviously, <clears throat> Because, first of all, you have the marvelous epiphany to experience uh, in overnight the complete uh, pivoting of the world. I mean, uh, the Mussolini fell down for the first time in July 43. Then he came back in September, but uh, for the first time, the fascism formally, and I was 11 years old. And I was, until that moment, educated uh, according to the criteria of the dictatorship. I was astonished by this sudden change of the story. The day after, my mother sent me to the newsstand to see if by chance there were a newspaper, because it was possible that with that uh, earthquake, <laughs> Not even the newspaper were published. And I found that the old newspapers were no more there. Only the new one with new titles. And one was of the Christian Democrats, the other one of the Liberal Party, the other one of the Socialist Party, the other one of the Communist Party. And so uh, uh, I was not so stupid to, to think that all those things uh, grew up overnight. Obviously, they were there some, somewhere before. And suddenly I understood what, what, what a dictatorship was. It could kept, uh, covered, and uh, compressed all those things that existed but were invisible. Or, in fact, they were uh, exiled in other countries. Uh, and I understand what a, a new and different world. In one day, so the, all the, the, the analysis I was able to make of what had happened to me in the previous um, 10 years uh, shaped my, my way of thinking and of judging the historical events uh, and so on and so forth. Probably it's because of that experience that I wrote that book <laughs> too. I would, be, I would be interested uh, why they didn't translate your manual for writing diploma thesis into English. But that's not a question for you. So for you, I would have a question. Uh, island of the uh, day before, theory of errors. What was your source 
of knowledge on that? My source of knowledge? Your source. Your source of knowledge on uh, the theory of errors in the island of the day before. That's uh, it. The, the theory of? Errors. Of the errors. Theory of errors, statistics. Uh, the, the deadline, no, 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 I, I missed the, the last word. The theory, the theory of mistakes, of the theory errors. of errors. I, you mentioned the, the island of the day before, yeah. isn't it? And the, where there was the question of the, the, the deadline, uh, dateline, uh, but the theory of? The errors cancelling themselves. For Errors cancelling themselves? I don't, I don't understand. Yes, the Agogi, but I don't remember to have spoken of a theory <laughs> of errors in the island the day before. I, I understood the, 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 the word, but I, I, I don't remember the, 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 the place. Uh, but let me first uh, answer your first question. Why I did uh, publish in English my... The, you know, because it was, uh, it was a book uh, how to make uh, a, a doctoral dissertation. It was designed on the situation of Italy at the time in which there was a doctoral dissertation, not at the time of PhD in America, but after the four years of BA. After the four years of BA in Italy, there was a doctoral dissertation that when it was well made, it was like a PhD dissertation. So my book was aiming at that kind. So in, in the Anglo-Saxon country, the story was different. So I, I always asked not to translate this book, and it was translated against my will in many other, in many other, uh, other countries. Uh, uh, also because at that time I also uh, tried to explain how to typewriting the dissertation. Then there was the computer that is still selling my book with instruction of how uh, typewriting it, and I think that for a young generation who had never seen a typewriter, <laughs> it is like I were a, a, a spy. As for the second question, would you tell something more about that? There are only if you had to explain an innocent are, person, uh, what I is hope the I don't, I don't confuse the book, but there are all these clocks on the vessel. Or these clocks used for determining? Ah, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, sure. Longitude, right? Am I right? Or, ah, you mean the and errors then, in the calculation of yes, the, calculation. the time lapse? Uh, and yeah, and then the point is that it is a theory of errors, a secret thing which they try to spy on them. And so I would like to know where do you know about it? Ah, oof, there is a. A lot uh, of literature about uh, that. But uh, the curious uh, story is that the same year my novel appeared, there was published a book by Dava Sobel on the affairs of longitudes, in which all those things are uh, very well explained. More or less as I did in my novel, simply we were resorting to the, same, uh, to the same sources. And I remember then we met and we, and we laughed. You know, sometimes you laugh. <laughs> Be because we gave the, the impression of having uh, to have copied each other. We published the book at the same uh, moment. So it's a, it's a very com complicated story, OK? And uh, the, I repeat, uh, uh, the Dava Sobel book is like that, but on the problem of longitudes, there are books like, like that. But I suggest you uh, go on Google, <laughs> call, for, call for longitudes, and for timekeepers, uh, longitudes, uh, selection, time, Keepers, and you find a lot of uh, a lot of elements. I apologize. I kept thinking you were saying arrows. That's why I didn't jump in because I thought, <laughs> thought I might end up inadvertently. Uh, uh, we have another question. You have described uh, the sensations 
the erotic sensations that you get when you're reading a book and you're able to write and all those things. I was wondering, what kind of an effect do, does the electronic media have on your writing and the creative process? I think that we can evaluate the effect of the electronic writing in the next 50 or 100 years. I have the impression, for instance, it will affect the syntax. Uh, there is always a certain difficulty in translating from Latin languages into Anglo-Saxon languages because uh, the Latin languages are uh, abundantly syntactic. I say, <coughs> I say something that in spite of that, instead of, therefore, uh, while uh, the Anglo-Saxon discourse is, is uh, hypotactic, uh, they put together many assertions, and you must make the uh, effect, uh, cause, and consequence. So it's very difficult to translate. When writing in uh, electronically, it happens to you to, to cut and paste and to move uh, your blocks. And by moving a block, if the block started with uh, uh, instead of, it cannot work in, this, in the new position. So you try to eliminate those uh, instead, uh, notwithstanding, uh, in spite, uh, therefore. That will change the style of the uh, Latin languages. The consecutio tempo. To what an extent, we don't know. It's, it's such a short uh, span of time, 30 years, more or less. So we, we, we don't know. Uh, it will uh, influence uh, the freedom of writing, because contrary to the stupid common uh, opinion, common opinion is always stupid, obviously. <laughs> if not, it would, wouldn't be common. Uh, uh, the machine doesn't eliminate uh, inspiration, uh, on the contrary, it helps. Because uh, while in order to write with a pen, your imagination is stopped by the resistance of the matter, with the computer it follows the, the, the rapidity of your brain. Then you have all the time to correct. No? So you, you can also to, to, to make mistakes. No? Right. So you go more, uh, you go faster, and it can, as it were, as it were, a sort of a surrealistic automatic uh, writing. But seems the common opinion. Eh? Uh, there was a, a critic that uh, said of my Foucault's pendulum, it is evident that is a book conceived uh, on the computer. Because one of my characters writes on, on the computer, but if a character writes on the computer, it doesn't mean that the book is conceived on the, on the computer. In the same sense in which uh, if Raskolnikov is a murderer, it doesn't mean that Dostoevsky was a murderer. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but because people identify uh, characters and author, or, and so it's evident that the book was conceived by the computer, except the last episode, the trumpet in the cemetery. That's his poetry, and it's seen that it was written by hand. Now, all the book was written even by hand, uh, except the scene of the cemetery that was written entirely the computer. <laughs> Because I thought of it so many times before that when I arrived to, to that point, I was like Rubinstein uh, yeah. at the piano. <laughs> I played it uh, without any hesitation, and I didn't correct it. It came uh, this way. So you see uh, how uh, the electronic uh, writing can change the so-called inspiration, felicity uh, of writing, and many other things. Let's, uh, we, have, we have time for one more question, and then uh, Professor Echo will be signing his books afterward. Um, 
uh, copies of the Prague Cemetery, and you're welcome to come and have your, your book signed. Yes? I would be interested if you could talk a little bit about how your work in semiotics, the relationship between that work and your fiction writing. How do each play into each other? I believe that they had no connection. <laughs> so I believe to be a scholar working uh, five days uh, per week uh, in the university and writing novels on the weekends. But the readers and the critics found many connections. <laughs> Which means that I had not such a, I was not schizophrenic. Uh, uh, there was a connection. Uh, since uh, uh, it's, ever, it's always difficult to, to make a judgment about one's own uh, activity, I can give you an element. Uh, there is a series in, in America called uh, The Library of Living Philosophers, uh, who started 50 years ago with uh, John Dewey, Bertrand Russell, uh, and since uh, things decline, uh, now I am the last one. Uh, <laughs> and, and I have to finish the job before my death, because it's the library of living philosophers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the, library, uh, the books, there are 1,000 pages books, consist of 100 pages written by uh, the, the thinker, sort of philosophical autobiography, and 25 essays written by different people to whom you are supposed to answer. So I'm terrified by this terrible perspective. And the editors of the series decide that the 25 essays in the book of the Library of Living Philosophy had to be not only about my academic work, but also about my novels, uh, seen as a contribution to, to philosophical and semiotical questions. Okay, that's that. Thank you all very much.